It's a long day and the, the weather out there is really nice. So. Um, so I believe we are live right now. Uh, I am going to start the um, Permanent Review Committee on the Commission of Chicago Landmarks. This is our regular meeting, Thursday, August 6th. Um, I'd like to start with the uh, calling the meeting to order with the roll call. Um, let's see, who do we have here? Uh, Commissioner uh, Jakovic. Here. Uh, Commissioner Aguirre. Uh, here. Uh, Commissioner Hughes. Present. And I'm Commissioner Wong. We do have a quorum. Uh, as many of you know, the governor recently signed the Public Act 101-0640, making certain amendments to the Open Meetings Act so that we, along with other boards and commissions, can continue to host virtual meetings during this COVID-19 public health emergency, provided that certain conditions are met. One of those conditions is that Chairman Leon, as head of the Commission in Chicago Landmarks, determined, uh, determined that an in-person meeting of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks is not practical or prudent. I want to make sure our virtual meetings meet all the conditions of the Open Meetings Act as amended. Therefore, I want to state, pursuant to the newly created Section 7E2 of the Open Meetings Act, uh, of the Open Meetings Act that Chairman Leon determined that an in-person meeting of this permanent review committee on the Chicago Commission on Chicago Landmarks is not practical or prudent. Similarly, Chairman Leon made a determination pursuant to the newly created Section 7E5 uh, that because of the disaster as declared by the governor, it is unfeasible for at least one member of the Chicago, one member of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks or its chief administrative officer or its chief legal officer to be physically present at the meeting place in so much that there is no physical meeting place. Um, pursuant to a resolution adopted by the Commission of Chicago Landmarks on June 4th, 2020, regarding the Chairman's emergency rule-making powers, Chairman Leone issued emergency rules governing the conduct of remote public commission meetings and provisions for remote uh, public participation effective June 23rd, 2020, in response to the COVID-19 emergency. These rules were posted on the Commission's land website. In line with these emergency rules, today's regular permit review committee meeting is a virtual meeting uh, being simulcast to the general public via live streaming. Permit review committee uh, meetings have been held virtually since May of this year. Meetings are structured to minimize the chances for technical difficulties. Members of the general public have been encouraged to submit written statements in advance of the meetings. No comments have been received. Members of the public desiring to speak at today's meetings were required to register before the meeting and verbal statements by the public for all agenda items will take place at the beginning of the meeting. Applicants and their representatives, as well as aldermen, were asked to contact staff if they desire to speak, and they will be able to do so after the staff presentation on the specific project. No one has re registered to speak on any of the agenda items, so we will now go through the agenda. Uh, so the first item is the approval of the minutes of the previous meeting on uh, the regular meeting of July 9th, 2020. I'd like to request a motion to approve those meet meeting minutes. Is there a motion? So moved. Uh, Commissioner Gary. Uh, second. And there's a second by Commissioner Hughes, was it? Yes, correct. Uh, it, those in favor, let's see, Commissioner Jack Fitch. Aye. And I uh, approve those minutes as well. Uh, unanimously, uh, those minutes are approved. First item on the agenda is a property located at 111 South Michigan Avenue, the historic Michigan Boulevard District in the 42nd Ward. This is a proposed removal of existing plywood infill and installation of limestone infill at two window openings on the west elevation. And uh, Joyce, if you could let us know what's going on. 
Great. Um, Chair Chair Wong, um, uh, I my, I'm gonna recuse myself from this um, from this application. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Gary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Ellerton Building of the Art Institute Chicago is one of 43 properties that make up the historic Michigan Boulevard District, designated in 2002. The Allerton Building, designed by Shepley, Rutan, and Coolidge in 1893, is the oldest part of the Art Institute's museum complex. The front facade features five arched openings at the center of the first floor and includes windows at each end with three entrance doors in the center. In the past 60 years, the windows flanking the three main entrance doors have been obscured and infilled, creating the facade we know today. In an effort to create a more secure, efficient, and welcoming facade, the Art Institute Chicago is proposing to remove the existing windows and painted plywood panels that are currently installed in the two arched window openings and infilling them with recessed limestone. This would both clarify the three entrance doors as well as improve the appearance, coherence, and security of the building. Currently, the museum name, logo, and operating hours are shown on the existing panels. The information is planned to be relocated to the entrance doors, and the proposed limestone infills will be left exposed with no plans to cover them with banners or signage. Based on archival photographs taken shortly after the museum's opening, the spaces directly behind the arch openings were originally galleries that, is, that displayed plaster casts. The view on the photo on the left was taken from the lobby looking south into the space that is now the museum shop. However, the use of these spaces has changed over the years. The space behind the existing north window was used as a coat check in the 1950s and then as an eager stare since 1985. The space behind the existing south window was a card shop in the 1950s and is now the museum shop. Both windows on the interior side are not visible as those walls are furred out with plaster finishes. Exposed windows would not be appropriate in these openings due to safety concerns as the egress stair leads directly into the museum and for programmatic reasons for the museum shop. As evidenced through historic images, the subject windows have been temporarily covered starting as early as the 1900s, seen here in this postcard on the left from 1907 and the photograph on the right from 1908. This postcard from 1915 shows the windows on the first floor to be covered with what appears to be blinds. The photo on the left from 1930 shows the subject windows again covered, and the photo on the right from 1938 shows blinds covering the subject windows. The photo on the left from 1945 shows the subject window covered with blinds, and finally the photos from 1959 and 1962 show a solid panel completely covering any view of the windows from the exterior, displaying announcements for the visitors similar to what we see today. While glazed windows in these locations were original to the facade, these two windows have had temporary coverings containing images and visitor information installed over them for more than 60 continuous years. On the left here is a wall section showing the existing condition that has the window in the opening with the painted plywood panel attached to the front. As you can see in the section on the right, the Art Institute is proposing to remove the existing windows and then fill the openings with a three and a half inch deep limestone unit um, with a two and five eighths inch concrete masonry, masonry unit backup. The proposed limestone infill is recessed nine and a half inches in the existing opening as well as having a two inch reveal all around the perimeter. This will create shadow lines that further um, emphasize the opening and differentiate it from the existing second floor blind arches, ultimately not to confuse it as an original design element. Staff recommends that the proposed limestone infill shall be recessed within the existing window opening as far back as possible and to increase the width of the reveal around the perimeter of the infill to four inches to further discern new and historic materials. The photo on the left is what the Art Institute looks like today. And the photo on the right shows a limestone infill rendered in the window openings. With the window openings infilled with limestone, it would both clarify the three entrance door in the center, as well as improve the overall appearance, coherence, and security of the museum. The applicant has submitted three options for the infill panel layout. In option one, the mortar joints in the proposed limestone infill align with all the mortar joints in the surrounding limestone. 
and in option two, the mortar joints divide the infill um, into six units with two horizontal joints and then one vertical joint down the middle. And then we have option three here, um, the mortar joints divide the infill into three units with two horizontal joints that align with the mortar joints on the existing limestone that surrounds the, um, the opening. Staff, prefer, staff prefers the appearance of option three as a panel layout creates an appearance that is uncomplicated and distinctly different than any other condition on the building. Additionally, the proposed infill will be differentiated from the existing bush hammered limestone by having a smooth finish. A sample of the proposed limestone shall be reviewed and approved by landmark staff for the finish and the color. Okay. And just to recap, the individual limestone unit sizes will be larger than the existing, recessed in the opening, incorporate a reveal around the perimeter and have a smooth finish. Staff believes that these differences will be apparent up close. However, from a distance, these differences will blend in with the existing facade so as not to stand out and affect the overall impression of the building. This will be in keeping with the general character of the building and will not be confused as an original design element. Okay. In conclusion, the proposed limestone infills in the existing arch window openings on the front facade is approved. Staff believes that the limestone infills do not have an adverse effect on the building since it is a reversible element and will not remove or damage the existing masonry opening. As proposed, if the window frames are original, they will be documented, carefully removed and stored in the event that the Art Institute Chicago decides to reinstall these windows in their original location or to match the profile and design for replacement windows in the future. Listed here are the staff recommendations, which were also addressed during the presentation. The Art Institute Chicago has reached out to Alderman Riley to inform him of the proposed work, and he has let us know that he has no objections. They also reached out to the Chicago Loop Alliance and they have no issues with this proposal and also submitted a letter of support just this week. This concludes my presentation. James Rondeau of the Art Institute Chicago is here and would like to make a statement. Additionally, Emily Benedict, also from the Art Institute of Chicago and the architect Charles Young of Interactive Design Architects are also here to answer any questions that the committee may have. I will now hand it over to Mr. Rondeau. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Joyce. Hold on. Uh, sure. Mr. Rondeau, um, if you could just wait just one second, please. Uh, I have to go through some procedural things. Does the committee have any questions of, uh, of Joyce at this time? And if not, then we can um, go. Yes, Commissioner Hughes. Chairman, my apologies. I, um, I sent you a message. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to recuse myself from this case or not. Um, I served on a jury recently for the selection of their um, 2020 fellow, fellowship program. Oh, uh, I don't believe so. Um, and we were, all of the jury members were compensated. Can I, th this is Michael Gaynor, can I ask? Can I ask, um, is that, is that um, in, you know, um, engagement complete? I mean, is that, that work is all done? It is, yes. Okay. Um, and I'm sorry, was this for this, the school or for the Art Institute per se? It's a, a fellowship that the Art Institute um, provides each year for architecture and writing students. So, I, I'm sorry, but I, I just mean, is it? Um, it is the Art Institute. It's the Art Institute, not the school of, okay. Um, I, think I, if, I think if I may speak, um, if, I believe that's the school. I mean, we are one corporation uh, in two halves, but I believe that fellowship is located at the school, not the museum. Excuse my interruption. Okay, awesome. Um, well, Commissioner, I appreciate you bringing it up. Um, I think if that if that uh, engagement for or whatever we want to call it is complete, um, and you're not currently, you know, uh, it's not ongoing, and there's not there's no other um, you know professional uh, type relationship you have with um, either the either the museum or the school. I think then that that should be okay. But I appreciate you bringing it up. Thank you. Okay. But it, it, in the end, the decision is yours. But I think it's I think it's okay. If, if you know, as, if as you've said, it, it's it's complete now. So sounds good. Okay. 
I, I think you're uh, you're clear, Commissioner Hughes. Um, uh, I'm going to request that you continue um, with, with this committee. Uh, so that being said, there are no other uh, questions of Joyce at this time. Uh, so Mr. Rondo, if you would continue, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm James Rondo. I'm the president and director of the Art Institute. I'll begin by thanking you, Chairman Wong. Thank you, Chairman Leon. Thank you to Commissioner Cox, who may no longer be with us. And of course, to thanks to all present commissioners. I'd also like to extend the museum's gratitude to the staff of the planning department, particularly for Joyce's uh, wonderful summary there. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you. I think it's quite an honor for us to be bringing this uh, presentation to you. And we appreciate your time and your thought. Um, I asked specifically if I could come before you to convey how very important this proposal is not only in the specific nature of this project, but in a larger vision for our institution. I know you have our proposal again, beautifully summarized by Joyce. My colleagues are on the call if you have specific questions, but I want to very briefly say that our proposal here is part of a larger strategy, simply in two parts. This is one of only two uh, part strategy for our facade, and that is to allow our historical Michigan Avenue facade to be more welcoming. Uh, the first point is that we want to jettison the notion of a dark void on our facade. Um, those, those plywood panels are painted black and, and there is, an, I think, an unwelcoming connotation to the darkness of that void uh, on our limestone facade. As Joyce said, the second reason is to clarify our three entrance doors to make the, the ascent of those staircases into three transparent glass entrances uh, uh, clearer. And third and finally, it will, I hope, harmonize uh, with the arches above with the proviso of the historical preservation guidelines not to mimic too closely. Lastly, I wanna say this again is, is, is part of a two-part strategy to make that limestone a bit you know, lighter, more welcoming, more clarifying. And within a year or so, we hope to turn all of our glass windows on the north and south of the proposed archway. Uh, they are now darkened, they're, they're, now, they're now blackened. We look closed even when we are open. We will uh, soon make those windows transparent glass, which will be, I think, completely, uh, uh, you know, in fitting with our historical mandate. So this limestone is again part of a larger strategy to be more hospitable, more welcoming, to project a welcoming civic presence in our historical facade on Michigan Avenue. Uh, and this is the end of what we will do, at least in my administration, to the Michigan Avenue facade. So there's no cause for concern for a broader programmatic set of proposals that would alter our facade in any way. It's simply this proposal before you today. And again, our, our, our desire to make our windows transparent instead of smoked. So with that, I conclude my remarks and thank you for the opportunity to present. Thank you, Mr. Rondo. Um, did uh, Ms. Benedict or, or Mr. Young, did you have anything to add to that? This is Emily, I have nothing further. James summarized it perfectly. Mr. Young, you're all. I think I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, does the committee have any uh, questions of Mr. Rondo uh, or any of the other applicants this time? Uh, having none, I, well, actually, hang on. I, I did have one question. Uh, there was a request to uh, increase the size of the reveal from two inches to four inches. Are you guys okay with that? Charlie, I give that to you. You know, I would say this is uh, we need to draw it up, but I think it's probably okay. Okay. Yeah. As, as I was looking at it, I, I will say that uh, I think the, you know, because these uh, openings are, are indeed um, uh, would have this uh, ability to be, uh, um, are not permanent, let's put it that way. Uh, I think that the the increased joint uh, or that reveal at a four inch uh, size, uh, especially from far away and given the scale, I think will do uh, do this uh, make this feel a lot better. So that's just my comment to it. So with that, if there are no other questions, then I would like to call for a motion to. Uh, approve the staff recommendations for this project. 
Is there a motion? There is a motion. Mr. Jakovic, a second. Second. Uh, that was. Sorry. Commissioner Hughes. Commissioner Hughes. Okay, then we'll call for a vote. Uh, Commissioner Aguirre. She recused herself. Oh, that's right. Thank you. Um, You're the only one left to vote. <laughs> I do approve it. The, the motion carries unanimously. Uh, good luck. Thank you so much for uh, everything that you guys do for the city of Chicago. And, and I think this will uh, help a lot. So uh, good luck with that. Thank you so much. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. Yep. Uh, next item on the agenda is the property located at 1020 West Randolph. Um, this is in the Fulton Randolph Historic District, proposed demolition of a one-story bank with drive-through and construction. This is demolition of a one-story bank with their drive-through and the construction of a new five-story building with mechanical enclosure, penthouse, and rooftop deck. This is in the 27th Ward, Walter Burnett's um, Ward. And Larry, you have this one. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Fulton Randolph Market Historic District was designated in 2015 to preserve historic buildings associated with early wholesale food marketing and distribution. The subject property is located at the northeast corner of Randolph and Carpenter. And as you said, it contains a one-story drive-through bank. Uh, this building was recommended as non-contributing in the Fulton Randolph Market designation report. Uh, because this uh, proposal also includes uh, demolition of that building, it is also subject to the relevant municipal code provisions, which govern the review of permits for demolition of 40% or more of any building or structure designated as a Chicago landmark or located in a district designated as a Chicago landmark. Uh, the applicants have also submitted a request to change the underlying zoning, and I believe that is currently under consideration. Let's go to the next slide here. Uh, so as I mentioned, this building was, was recommended as non-contributing in the designation report. Uh, rather than go through all of the criteria, I just want to mention that this building was built, I believe, in 2003, which pretty much uh, excludes it from the district's period of significance. And so we are recommending that it is, in fact, a non-contributing building. Moving right along. Uh, so when we evaluate infill construction in the district, the applicants provide us with enough contextual uh, background to evaluate it. Uh, they have provided these streetscape illustrations to illustrate the historic context of the building. Uh, the adjacent historic buildings uh, along Randolph are two and four stories in height, and they range from 32 to about 52 feet in height. Uh, there's also a contributing building immediately across Randolph and that is five stories in height for a total height of about 78 feet. Uh, additionally, there's a, a tower portion of 1032 Randolph across the street to the west, and that is 70 feet in height. Uh, this proposed five-story building is uh, nearly 69 feet in height along the street, and we're recommending that this is compatible with the historic buildings in the district. Uh, additional height is required for mechanical enclosure and penthouse, as well as the elevator override. Uh, however, these enclosures are set back uh, from the south and west parapets uh, in keeping with the uh, Fulton Round F Market Historic District design guidelines. Uh, so we're recommending approval of those as well. Uh, so the proposed building will have zero lot lines along Randolph and Carpenter, which will maintain the historic street wall typical for the district and that, that site will actually be improved by the elimination of that drive-through and two curb cuts as well. So the proposed five-story building uh, utilizes alternating widths of vertical masonry piers to organize the facade. Uh, the wider piers extend to grade and terminate at granite bases and create the storefront divisions. Uh, the floors are divided by patterned brick spandrels uh, the use of varying orientations and patterns of brick acknowledges the level of detail and variety found on historic buildings within the district. Uh, the brick patterns, insets, and projections are clarified a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, and there's also sort of a cast stone band above the first floor 
which visually divides it from the floors above. Uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, there are aluminum mullion windows on the upper floors. Uh, these are contemporary in design, uh, but are similar in appearance to double hung windows uh, that are found within the district. Uh, the proposed storefronts incorporate vertical aluminum mullions and a substantial horizontal mullion divides the upper storefront into transom windows. Uh, we're recommending that these storefronts have a dark factory applied finish and that the dimensions and details be submitted with the permit plans. Uh, this sheet here includes some of the exhibits that the applicants provided to kind of explain some of their investigation into the historic character of the district and uh, some of the details that helped uh, uh, inform their design. And here's a little bit more detail just to kind of clarify how these elements will work together. Uh, I also wanna mention that there are notes related to potential signage in the upper portion of the transom window. And I just wanna say that this, um, this isn't actually a sign package, but uh, that location would typically be acceptable. Uh, but I do wanna note that historic preservation staff will review and approve all signage details as separate permits. So let's go to the last one and we are recommending approval of, with, with these conditions. The first two related to the demolition of that existing building and the bottom ones related to uh, issues that I touched on in my presentation. And I won't read them again unless you want me to. Uh, that concludes my presentation. If you have questions for me, I know that the development team is also on the call if you uh, have any questions for them. Well, thanks so much, Larry. Uh, does the committee have any questions of Larry at this time? Seeing none, uh, I'd like to ask if the applicant would like to make a statement. If you could identify yourself. Um, Mr. Commissioner, this is Whitney Robinette. Hello. Hi. I'm a principal at L3 Capital and I represent ownership. And I just wanted to thank Larry for his detailed presentation. We're very excited about this project and we hope that by uh, designing and developing this project on this location on this district that we will be able to add to the character of the neighborhood and and honor the integrity that's uh, been established uh, around us so thank you very much we appreciate your time and i welcome any comments or questions that uh, the commission may have uh thank you uh, uh whitney um does the committee have any questions of whitney or the architect who I believe is here as well. Uh, Commissioner Hughes. Yeah, I, I, it's not really a, a question, more of a comment per se. Um, I think this building um, fits in perfectly with the char character that the existing character, the historic character, and also the new properties that are developing in this area. I have noticed um, on a recent visit over there that a lot of the corners are going taller um, and kind of sam sandwiching um, the lower properties, which is building a certain type of character for that area as well. But the brick, the window spacing, the heights, it's all in context um, with the surroundings and is much appreciated. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Hughes. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? Um, I, I did have a, actually a couple of questions. Uh, you know, it was interesting to me the the masonry details were pretty uh, pretty cool, and so I commend you on that. One of the quest questions I had though um, was I right in seeing that there was a uh, a dark sill and and header? Is that is that correct on the window openings? Uh, I can address that, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Um, there are in fact uh, metal channels uh, that okay. act as the lintels and sills. And uh, in the staff analysis, we recommended that that was a, an acceptable contemporary approach to a, a more of a tip, what you would typically see as, as brick or stone. So you're correct, those are, those are different material entirely. Okay, thank you, Larry. They're they're pretty cool. It's a it's a really interesting treatment. I've seen that before, um, and uh, it, this certainly does fit in with the with the neighborhood. Uh, okay, no other questions. 
therefore, I'd like to uh, call for a motion to approve the staff recommendations. Motion. And is there a second? Second. Second with uh, uh, Commissioner Djokovic. So, Commissioner Hughes, your vote? I motioned. Oh, Commissioner <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Thank you for messing us up. <laughs> I'm yes. sorry, did you say yes? Okay, mm -hmm. and I'm proving that as well. The, the, uh, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you so much. Uh, good luck with that. And uh, I think we're going to see you again very soon. Thank you. All right. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the property located at 932 West Randolph in the Fulton uh, Randolph Market District. Again, in uh, Alderman Burnett's uh, ward, this is a proposed redevelopment of an existing three-story non-contributing building, including the replacement of all exterior walls and construction of a new three-story side addition. And uh, there you have this one as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you mentioned, this is uh, once again, back in Fulton Randolph Market Historic District, uh, just down the street. Um, I'm not gonna bore you with all of the other historical stuff, but as you mentioned, this was also recommended in the designation report as a non-contributing building. Uh, so this is a bit different than the other proposal. The applicants are proposing to remove the exterior walls of the building while maintaining the existing floor structure. And they are proposing to construct a three-story addition uh, on the north side of the building where there currently is a surface parking lot. Uh, because this is such a substantial change, it's basically being reviewed as, as new infill design. Uh, again, it is subject to the same uh, code provisions that relate to the removal of 40% or more of a building uh, in a historic district. So this will eventually have to have that partial demolition approved uh, by city council. Uh, oh, I should also mention, just like the other project, this is going through a rezoning process as well. Uh, so, again, this is just how much of that existing building is being removed, and those are the, the demo elevations, uh, the image on the bottom right shows how much of the structure uh, will remain. And, um, you know, again, this building was built uh, in 2002, so it's really outside of the district's period of significance. So we're recommending that, it, uh, that its non-contributing status be confirmed. Moving on, again, to evaluate this design, uh, the applicants provided a, a number of uh, context exhibits, uh, and this is the streetscape to illustrate that existing character uh, uh, included on that block as well as the block to the, uh, to the east. Uh, the adjacent historic buildings are two to four stories in height and they range from about 33 feet to about 59 feet. Uh, the proposed height of that modified three-story building is 54 feet, a little bit more than that actually, but that is within the historic range. Uh, however, uh, the most comparable adjacent historic building is four stories in height, illustrating the difference in typical floor heights between the new and the old. Uh, because the existing structure of the building is being maintained, it is really not possible to substantially alter those established floor heights. Uh, the, the proposed north portion of the building is entirely new, and you can see that on the bottom streetscape, uh, and it is intended to align with the existing floor and roof heights. Uh, additionally, that northeast corner is slightly greater in height to accommodate a stair and elevator override, and there are similar historic examples in the district which have, uh, have tower details that are comparable to this. Let's go to the next one. So this is a site plan just to kind of clarify the, uh, uh, the change in, uh, in plan. Obviously, this is the existing building, and there's that new addition, and then here's sort of an eagle's eye view to show how that relates to the, uh, the surrounding buildings. Uh, okay, let's talk about the design. Uh, the proposed design incorporates a red a brick cladding for the first two floors, uh, two-story vertical brick piers, which divide and organize the facade into bays, the bays which are uh, consistent with uh, other historic bay divisions within the district. Uh, the brick details, again, incorporate a number of different orientations and insets 
to acknowledge the typical level of detail uh, incorporated into many historic facades within the district. Uh, the third floor incorporates a more contemporary metal and glass cladding. Metal panels in the upper portion of the, first, of the third floor screen mechanicals and ceiling structure from view. Uh, the use of a metal and glass curtain wall has been approved in the district for rooftop additions. Uh, in this case, the applicant maintains that the cladding is a design choice uh, to lighten the appearance of the third floor and to draw less visual attention to the floor height differences between this and the adjacent two-story buildings. Uh, according to the applicant, the cladding also addresses issues related to necessary clearances between the curtain wall and the supporting frame. Uh, we're recommending that in this case, the third floor treatment is compatible and is supported by the Fulton Randolph Market Design Guidelines, which encourages contemporary design, which acknowledge the historic scale and proportion uh, of the district. Uh, as I might have, you know, actually, before we jump to that one, uh, I might have noticed noted that there is an existing terrace uh, on the top of that building that will be retained for the for the revised building, and they're proposing to build a sort of a glass safety railing uh, on the front portion of that that space. Uh, the proposed storefronts incorporate large panes of glass with uh, transom windows above and solid bulkhead panels below. A substantial horizontal mullion divides the transom windows. Uh, the corner of the first floor here. Uh, incorporates a metal clad rectangular column, which also has some historic precedent for storefronts within the district. Uh, second floor windows are divided by metal mullions to create a vertical orientation with a, a transom window above. Uh, these windows project outward from uh, approximately two inches from the masonry facade. Uh, punched window openings with inset windows are a common historic condition in the district although there are examples of steel casement windows with less pronounced insets. Uh, in this case, the applicant maintains that deeply inset windows are not possible due, the, due to the proximity of the supporting columns. Uh, we are recommending that the size, orientation, and divisions of these windows are compatible with the overall characteristics of historic windows within the district. Okay, let's go to the next sheet. Um, again, these applicants have provided some uh, uh, exhibits to kind of explore the historic characteristics of the buildings in that district and to demonstrate how those have informed uh, their current design. And you can see a number of examples here, including some photos of some existing projecting towers in the district. Um, here, uh, this building on the lower right and the building right next to it. Uh, so we are recommending that that is also a suitable treatment for this building. And here are just some, um, the ground floor, second and third floor plan, just to kind of give you a better sense of the, the overall elevations. Uh, let's go to the next one. So the applicants also did include a signage proposal with their submittal. Um, and so uh, that's what you see uh, outlined in those transparent red areas. Uh, these include individual letter signs mounted on the transom bars and centered above each storefront, as well as blade signs mounted to the vertical masonry piers at the first floor. Uh, a vinyl graphic is sign is shown on the metal cladding of the north elevation, but this is set back substantially from the, the street uh, and may be minimally visible. Uh, Staff recommends that the committee conceptually approve the size and location of these signs, but notes that all sign permit applications must be reviewed and approved by historic preservation staff, and that the number of signs will respond to the number of tenants. Uh, in cases where the tenants occupy more than one storefront bay, staff recommends that primary signage be permitted on alternating storefronts and alternating masonry piers only. So we are recommending approval. Um, first two related to the demolition of that, partial demolition of the existing building. And the third related to the conditions that I touched upon in my presentation. Um, so that concludes uh, what I've got to say. Again, the development team is here. Um, as you mentioned, this is the, uh, the same uh, ownership of the previous project, uh, but I believe the uh, architects are, are different. Um, so that's all I got. Uh, thank you, Larry. Really appreciate that. Uh, does the committee have any questions for Larry at this time? I just uh, make a comment. Yeah, Commissioner Jakovich. I uh, 
first, I think the, the presentation was excellent. Um, really, really going to be a, a great improvement to that existing building. Um, so I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to that. It's it's uh, amazing, beautiful, beautiful drawings. Really carefully designed and um, thoughtful, and uh, definitely um, you know look forward to the change. So good job. Thank you, Commissioner Jekovic. Um, your your candor is uh, appreciated. Um, uh, is the does the development team would you guys like to make a uh, a, a statement on this uh, this item? Hi, Mr. Commissioner. This is Whitney Robinette again with L3 Capital. I just want to thank Larry for the very detailed report and acknowledge that I uh, do agree with all the recommendations made today, including that related to signage, and appreciate the commission's. Um, questions, comments, and our architects are here to answer those as well. So thank you again, appreciate your time and uh, appreciate your support. Great, thank you. Uh, does the uh, committee have any questions of the development team? You saw a comment from Commissioner Jekovic earlier. Um, I think this is a great improvement as well. I mean, that that uh, uh, the building is, uh, even though that was done in but as a 2002, it's pretty outdated. Uh, so I think this is really going to be exciting to see. I have this. a quick, a quick question. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, Commissioner Hughes yeah. has her her hand raised. I'll go after her. No. Go ahead. Okay, I'm just curious. Um, this is a commercial building, I'm assuming. Um, correct. Commercial That's use? correct. Yeah, office. Um, is there just because it was adjacent to a where it's replacing the parking lot? I'm just curious how the um, the loading. What is that? What is that um, is being resolved here? That's a great question. So there, we're actually setting our property back ten feet from the northern property line, and we're going to have a ten by twenty mm. foot loading zone right off of Sangamon. So it's going to be at the northeast corner mm. of the property. Oh yeah, I'm seeing now. Yeah. Yeah, proposed site plan, perfect. Um, thank you, yeah, I was just curious because it was really tight. Um, and that this is the drawing that demonstrates that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree, um, very impressive. Um, I think bringing more uses that allow for um, the vibrancy of that street, a lot of transparency. Um, I think it's, it's, it's gonna look um, really, really compelling. Thank you. Um... I don't see any more comments. If not, uh, I'd like to call for- I did one. have a comment, sorry. Uh, Commissioner Hughes, go ahead, I'm sorry. Thank you, it's okay. I, I wanted to let um, Commissioner Geary go first. Um, I just wanna say that this was tastefully done. Um, the building still has some traditional um, character to it with the brickwork, obviously, but even tying in the proportions of those, um, you know, framed windows with the, the windows at the top of the more contemporary roof edition, um, it's just very tastefully done. Um, the mix of materials, I think um, adding on to what Commissioner Gary said, it is, going to draw in the community and, and bring some vibrancy to this area. And the existing building was done in 2002 and someone approved this, but um, no, we're, we're onward and upward. And also I do wanna, the last thing I wanna say is I really appreciate you guys taking an existing structure and keeping that, uh, the bones, you know, keeping the floors, keeping the interior and really giving it a facelift to the outside. You know, we need more of that with, with us needing to um, really increase our sustainability efforts for the survival of our planet. So thank you so much. Um, I know it's a ton of work and you guys are the champions uh, for this project. I look forward to seeing it. Thank you, Commissioner Hughes. Uh, actually, you bring up a really good point. Um, one that I actually w was wondering about as you as you continue to, uh, as you're you reusing the structural system of the building, um, I would well imagine that on top of the sustainable uh, benefits of that, you also happen to save a little bit of money, I would imagine. Um, so uh, that's 
uh, kudos to you for that. I know that uh, it is harder and harder to do these buildings at a at a at a cost that is um, uh, you're able to to maneuver that. So uh, kudos to you. Thank you. With that, uh, I'd like to call for a motion to uh, well, approve. Just real quick, I mean, with that being said, you know. It's a very good point about the reuse of, of, of existing buildings, but is there any thought to all the masonry of the existing building and how that could, you know, be recycled? <laughs> recycled. <laughs> Something. Because that actually that building has a lot of brick, the existing building, which is part of the issue. But I just wanted to throw that out there since we are talking about the sustainability of re rehabilitation. Development. There's a lot of brick there. So that's, that's a great, that that's great, a great question. And I, I would love for our architectural team to, to chime in, but uh, we felt that the existing brick that's on that building isn't actually contextual with the rest of the district. It's very shiny. Um, it's almost a purple hue. And you know, surrounding us, we have more of the kind of traditional red brick buildings uh, that really create the character. So we felt that it wasn't appropriate to reuse in this particular setting, but that would have been a, a great way to be sustainable. Um, but we are fortunate that we're able to save, save that steel structure and but save is, some money there. But is there any way to recycle it somewhere else or divert it from landfill or anything like that, that, you know, instead of not reusing it, I agree. Um, but it's just a, another thought to consider when, you know, we're talking about sustainability. Um, yeah, that's a great question. And um, Katie Lambert from OKW is on the phone as well or on the presentation. And I would certainly welcome her thoughts. I'd say we haven't gotten that far into the process yet. Uh, we're still working with our team to uh, make the recommendation to the staff on the actual selection of the brick. And so as we go through that process, we can certainly look into um, finding a source that would allow us to reuse some old brick or, uh, you know, recently uh, recycled brick. Yeah, I agree. Um, this is Katie Lambert from OKW Architects. Um, Whitney, I agree with everything that you said that the reason that we decided not to use this brick for this building was because we're actually trying to really contribute even further to the historical quality of the district and we didn't feel like this brick was really there. Um, but it's an interesting question and I think actually as we're, we're starting to talk with the general contractors um, about the, the, the process of executing this project and they may have some good sources or at least a little more insight into where we could put this brick as opposed to just dumping it in the landfill. I think it's a great thought. Thank you. Commissioner Jekovic, you're good with that uh, yeah, reply? No, that's great. I think it's just something to think about, you know, it's, yeah. uh, just yeah, as totally. to assemble the building. Maybe you cut, cut a little bit more costs with, uh, with the GC. Um, having that, I'd like to call for a motion to approve the staff recommendations for this. So moved. Uh, Commissioner Hughes. Second. And a second. second. Um, so we'll take a vote. Uh, Commissioner Geary. Yes. Uh, and I approve that as well. So uh, unanimously, this uh, motion is approved. Good luck. Uh, you got two for one today. I know you had to sit through a long time, but uh, you get two for one today. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, we'll see. We'll be delighted to see this, these buildings go off. Thank it feels, you. It feels like they're in a mission to take all the buildings with arches and you know, yeah. reti <laughs> retire them. <laughs> is, uh, gone. <laughs> okay, the last project on our agenda today is the property located at 87 East Wacker Drive. This is the London Guarantee Building um, in the 42nd Ward. This is a proposed new detached canopy over an entrance to second floor restaurant on the West Elevation and accompanying signs. And Emily, I think you have this one. Yes, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, so in 2019, Ocean Prime, which is a steakhouse restaurant, moved into the second floor tenant space of the London Guarantee Building. The restaurant's primary entrance is on the building's west elevation along Wacker Drive. Um, Lacking a first floor storefront, but still eager to mark their entrance to pedestrians, the applicants have submitted a canopy over their first floor entrance for review. 
So the canopy has been designed to be compatible with the building without competing with the ornate facade. As you can see, it's quite ornate. Um, as I mentioned, the tenant occupies the second floor, which is shown here in red, uh, with the remainder of tenants all on the first floor. While first floor tenants get the benefit of street level storefronts, signage and awnings, Ocean Prime is left with only one storefront bay, which leads to their second floor access. Because this tenant occupies the entirety of the second floor, this is a unique condition and will not be repeated along other storefronts on the building. So the applicant is proposing to construct a freestanding canopy. Uh, it consists of an aluminum structure with a black painted finish. It's one and, one and a half feet tall aluminum cabinet panels on all sides, um, topped with an approximately two inch gold border that slightly projects from the face of the panels. Uh, the canopy measures 13 foot 10 inches wide and 10 and a half feet tall, projecting out approximately seven and a half feet from the storefront um, and is designed to be framed by the decorative elements original to the building, not obscuring or attaching to any historic uh, ornamentation. It's held off of the building approximately two inches and uh, is therefore needs to be supported by four aluminum poles painted gold. Um, Staff recommends that the gold color on the poles and top border be revised uh, to be closer to the dark gray finish, um, as you can see on the finish of the historic storefronts. Uh, the canopy is simple in design while clearly differentiating from the original building and does not touch the building, making it easily removable in the future should another tenant move in. Because of this unique to the building tenant situation, the location of the canopy, not touching the facade, and at the minimal design, staff recommends that a canopy marking this entrance to the restaurant is appropriate. Uh, the applicant is proposing to add um, some minimal signage on the north and south canopy faces. The west facing panel will simply show um, the building's address. So the two signs are identical, centered within the aluminum panels, approximately six feet, six inches long with eight inch tall letters. Um, the letters as well as the address number will have solid opaque faces and uh, be halo lit from behind. Um, staff recommends approval of the signs as proposed. Uh, so this one's this one's pretty easy. It's, uh, I went through our staff recommendations. Um, we recommend approval. Uh, the alderman's office has indicated that they have no concerns with this uh, with this proposal, and I believe um, representatives both of ownership and the sign designer are, are here. If you have any questions for them, thank you, Emily. Does the uh, does the committee have any questions of Emily at this time? Having none, um, is the uh, applicant, would you like to make a, a statement on this? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Andres Mahon here. Uh, is everybody able to hear me? Yes. This pandemic is training me in new technology, which is a good thing. So thank you for your time. Uh, Emily, uh, we worked together on different projects and I think she did a phenomenal job. I'm happy it was not me and it was her. Um, I would just like to uh, add a couple of comments. Uh, we've been working on this project for over a year and a half uh, to develop the final product, making sure everybody waits in and uh, has a say on it. And we took that into consideration. Uh, the architect behind it, it's Mark Nauer, who's very well known in the Chicago, at least restaurant industry, developing um, uh, great end products. And also um, the canopy was reviewed and approved by uh, MPS and SHIPO by the National uh, Park District uh, all the way in Washington. And then it was reviewed uh, in Illinois in Springfield by the State Historic Preservation Office, also with uh, Tom Up. Uh, we went through multiple changes. Uh, they weighed in their comments and concerns. We had adapted the, the overall concept. And then the final touch was by uh, Emily and the Landmarks uh, uh, Committee, who had some extra elements. And I think they all 
work well together and they will complement the, the uh, building and will definitely like highlight the entrance for a spectacular restaurant. If you guys did not try Ocean Prime, we have here Wayne who's on the ownership side uh, and, and I highly recommend that. Um, so it's, it's a great piece of art. Uh, it will be made with the highest grade of quality uh, we do plan the, the posts, they are going to be brass just to kind of keep the old concept structure and complementing, complementing the building. Um, everything, uh, the, the product itself will be made in USA. Um, we take pride in that uh, at Triangle Sign and Awning. I am the president here. Uh, so uh, overall, the canopy will have a high-end look and will complement the building and the bay entrance. Uh, the one thing I would like to mention there uh, is that uh, for Alderman Riley's request, the signage itself will be controlled by a dimmer, uh, allowing to minimize the, the impact of the halo lit uh, signage. So there was also a big one and we address that as well so uh, i can go in order uh, by uh we address all concerns on, on uh alderman riley's and uh the michigan avenue the meg mile association also we had a presentation months back they are also supportive of this project uh the landlord obviously and then we run it by the mps and by SHIPO for approval and now Thankfully, we are in front of you guys um, asking for your blessing. And Emily, again, I really appreciate the wonderful cooperation here from start to hopefully end and for a great presentation. It was, it was wonderful seeing you. Thank you. And thank you all, uh, the commissioners, for your time. Thank you, Andre. You Did guys you... have a pain. I've been here since one o'clock and you guys have been through a painful process. That's, that's my two cents on it, okay? Andre, could you clarify again? Uh, you are with uh, the owners. The I, I am the president. I am the sign kind. I am the guy that's going to build the canopy. So oh, triangle okay. sign and awning. Uh, we are the sign contractor that work with Mark Nauer, the architect. Okay. Uh, and then there is also at the end of the um, uh, ownership, Wayne. If there okay. are any it's questions, it's I assume he received the link. I assume. Yeah. Okay. Um, does the committee have any questions of Andre at this time? I did have one, which was, you just mentioned, however, because I understood that uh, given Emily's presentation that the, the, um, the columns that are holding up this freestanding sign were going to be cast aluminum, and now you've identified them, them to be brass. Uh, which is it? So, it's whatever Emily is recommending, whatever the landmarks are recommending, we're gonna, for us, originally on the, on the drawings, we propose brass uh, posts. Uh, the main concern on the sign world, or my concern, and what I wanna highlight, the entire structure will be made of uh, non-corrosive products, meaning it's either gonna be an all aluminum finished uh, black and gold, or we'll have an all aluminum with brass uh, post, but there will be no rusting involved that may stain or alter anything from the sidewalk to uh, whatever uh, surroundings are, like the building or the facade. So that, that's the only comment I would make. So Emily, you noted that it was, uh, this was gonna be aluminum, and you also noted that uh, you wanted this to go from a gold color to uh, a a gray color. Yeah, just to just to match the the cast iron that's on all of the existing yes. stores. Okay. And you're in agreement with this, Andre? Yes, absolutely, hundred okay. percent. Thank you. Uh, now, just a quick question for Emily: the band on the top, we're gonna keep that gold, correct? No, it was that it all all of the gold be revised to the. Excellent. So we'll, we'll do black with the matching color of the existing elements, uh, replacing the gold. Yeah, that's perfect. Noted, consider it done. Excellent. 
Okay. Uh, the second question I had, sir, uh, was uh, how is that being attached to the sidewalk, these columns? Is that a flange system that's bolted to the sidewalk? What happens? Right. So the posts, uh, the posts are going to be uh, bolted to the concrete and mm -hmm. there will be like four flanges that will slide on top, uh, giving a pleasant appearance uh, and minimizing any exposure to the bolts itself. Okay, is that good? I, I I'm just wanted to bring it up. You may want to, uh, depending on how wide those flanges are, that it does not cause any kind of a tripping hazard. Um, and that it, that is as minimal as you can get. Uh, so. Um, I just, will make a note of that. That's a good point. Uh, the, the entire concept uh, and the guidelines uh, was presented to the zoning and the public right of way uh, who approved the uh, okay. package before he made it to the landmarks and everything is within the city of Chicago code. Okay. But I will make an extra note of that. Thank you for the recommendation, Commissioner. Uh, does any other of the committee members have any questions regarding this? And I am seeing none. Therefore, I'd like to call for a motion to approve the staff recommendations for this project. So move. Uh, that's Commissioner Geary? Correct. Uh, is there a second? S second, second. Second, uh, Commissioner Djakovic. Commissioner Hughes, your vote? Yes. And I vote yes as well. Uh, the, the motion carries unanimously. Good luck. You did a year and a half to get to this point. Uh, move forward and good luck with uh, with the business. It was painful, but not because of you guys. There were <laughs> other. <laughs> we, we endure our own pain over here. Uh, I've seen that. <laughs> I've seen that all afternoon. So, all right. Thank, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Have thank you. Day. Thank you, guys. So, uh, permit review committee. That is it of our uh, meeting today. Uh, and. Uh, I, I guess I could request a motion to adjourn then. I'm yes. Oh, moved. Oh, moved. sorry. Second. 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 All right. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Folks, thank you so much. It's been a long afternoon, but appreciate it.